you may be seated. Well, good morning. Uh, our tithes and offerings uh, may be put in the, the box, the middle box in the back. Do you need any reminder of that? Uh, thank you for your, for your generosity and your, your faithfulness. Uh, also, you can go online to crossroadschurchvt.org, and there's a drop down there where you can actually start uh, giving online if that's your preference. Uh, more and more, that's, that's sort of what we do uh, for our, the rest of our finances, and you're certainly welcome to do that as well. Uh, the uh, Teen Challenge will be coming to Crossroads in November. Uh, and if you have never heard the Teen Challenge Choir, it's, it's quite a treat. You've got the, the chorus of the redeemed just praising God. From, and, and, and these folks, uh, redemption isn't just, you know, just uh, a matter of faith. It's, it's of their, their whole lives. And praise God for that. And we look forward to that. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Super. Wednesday night prayer, 6.30, 7.30, virtually via Zoom. You can email uh, Stephen Scher at Comcast.net, Steve Sheridan, for the Zoom link. Uh, men's breakfast coming up Saturday, September 12th, 8 a.m. Uh, really looking forward to that. Rich Curtis will be giving his testimony. And church decorating. Uh, to decorate the fall, church for the fall, uh, Tuesday, September 8th, 6.30 p.m. And that is uh, not this coming Tuesday, but a week from. That's right. Ladies Fellowship, Saturdays, 10 a.m. and Tuesday, 6.30 p.m. Women's Bible Study at church and online, Tuesday, September 15th, 6.30. Contact Karen Winchester or Renee Evans. And Children's Church will be in church and broadcasting online starting at 10 a.m. Uh, via Microsoft Teams, Sunday at 10 a.m. here. And the harvesting for real going on out there. Uh, head on, don't, don't leave church without going back out and, and, and filling up a bag with all sorts of goodies. Boy, I tell you, those fresh tomatoes compared to the store-bought, there is no comparison. Yum. Uh, if you need prayer, uh, prayer at crossroadschurchvt.org. Uh, was able to uh, talk with Torsten. Uh, some of you may have been wondering about communion. It's been a long time since we've had communion. Well, we're trying to figure that out, how to do that in a, you know, socially distanced, appropriate way. Uh, but uh, this is on our, this is on the front burner. Okay, this is something we want to, we're, we're planning on. And I have a many prayer requests that I gathered beforehand. Uh, have, I, have I missed any? Any others that I haven't spoken with you? You, you want to share now? Uh, yes. I woke up with a low back pain today, so. Oh, boy. So, Jan Preve, low back pain. Okay. And... Yes, the Almighty, the master of the universe, the creator of the rolling spheres, cares about our lower back pain. And I don't know about you, I, I, hmm, I'll never get over that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, that would be. Yes. Yeah. 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 And you know, those two go together. God's forgiveness and world peace, they go together. Tell me your name again. Wyatt. Wyatt. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's go to prayer. Father, we lift up to you 
We have many requests this morning, uh, and, and you know them, and yet you ask us to bring them to you. So in faith and in obedience, we do. Lord, we pray for comfort for Harold's family. His uncle has died. There's children and grandchildren without, without the leader of the band anymore. And we, we do pray for, for comfort for them and also that this might be a divine opportunity that, that they would, uh, as, as their uncle has gone through that door, someday they too will go through that door as we all will. And Jesus will be waiting on the other side and what shall we tell him? We pray for healing for Val's husband, for Daniel. Good MRI results for Val. And healing for her sister-in-law, Carol. And Lord, we continue to bring to you Deb Spaulding's living situation. Uh, talk about world peace. Well, we would like peace just in that situation, right in that, that starting there. Um, that there would the conflict that is ongoing there with their landlord would cease, would end, and bring glory to your name. Ellen's husband Steve begins radiation September eighth. Lord, we give him. We ask that you give him comfort and wisdom, and the sense that this tent, when it when it does, and in your time when it's ready, uh, the tent will will collapse, but the spirit will go on and be with you. But Lord, we pray for, for healing now for Steve. Uh, Lord, and we lift up Davina's family to you in the Philippines, uh, her sister, Clarita, who has some ovarian bleeding, and we ask for wisdom and for healing for her and for doctors. We pray for some anxiety issues in Mary Tony and Clarita's daughter. Uh, and also for uh, family member Christina, who is having corona-type respiratory problems. And we pray for, for healing of spirit and body in, in Davina's family in the Philippines. Uh, Lord, we lift up to you uh, Kim Farone's uh, housemates. Uh, they're uh, believers. And uh, Pat's sister, Jean, with heart problems. And Dana with back problems. And uh, Lord, we just ask that uh, you would glorify your name and, and meet these women right in the problems of their heart and their back because it's who you are. And we ask that for, a, for water for the, the Curtis family. Uh, there are eight families. Uh, their water system is on the blink, either because of a leak or a low water table or something, but Lord, we ask for that be fixed because they need water. Now we, Lord, we pray for healing for Matt Premont's ongoing headaches. He's out working today, but it's really hard. This headache and chronic head pain is a tough, tough thing. And and uh, he's a tough guy, Lord. But we we ask for for healing for him. Uh, for Jan Preve, for her lower back pain. And also, uh, we agree with Wyatt. Uh, forgiveness. We are thankful for it, and we ask for more of it. Uh, for people who don't know it yet, either both forgiveness among each other, and also especially with you. And that that's where peace begins. World peace begins with forgiveness between people and God who then extend it to others as well. May it be and may it start with us, as the song goes. And we, we ask your continued blessing. We thank you that we are able to glorify you with each other, the essence of worship. Glorify the Lord with me. We thank you for that. May it continue. And may you bless the reading of the word of God story of Daniel and the expounding of it from Torsten's mind and his lips, blessing our hearts and our knowledge and our worship of you, that you would, that it would prepare the way for your coming. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Yes, sir. Ah.
Ooh. Okay. Do it right now. Lord, we lift up our sister Jane, our faithful sister Jane, faithful to, to pray and to serve you and for her zeal for this for your kingdom and for this country. Thank you, Lord, for her. And we pray for healing. We pray that that foot and that wrist, uh, that they would be back in commission as soon as possible. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel of peace. And we pray that hers would be restored for that purpose. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, worship team. says magnify the Lord with me. I've just always loved that. I could just picture the angels joining us as God's people magnifying the Lord together. As Brad and I were watching this on we're watching this on YouTube to get ready for this. The Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir is singing this song with like four hundred voices. Imagine what that sounds like. Like just said, it's better than the Brooklyn Tab. It's it's the angels. It's the people who've gone before. It's it's us. And someday <laughs> we're going to be singing the song and songs like it for real in God's presence. So this is just a dress rehearsal for that wonderful moment.
Father, we have read in your word the things that you have done. You parted the Red Sea. You pulled your nation out of Egypt. And the army that was following you destroyed by putting that sea back in place. Your son Jesus walked into a, a burial chamber, grabbed the hand of a little girl and said, come on, wake up, wake up. You are still the same God you were then. You're still that same God now. Those stories aren't just stories. They are things that happen, Lord, and put in our hearts the belief, the faith, that those same things can happen again. Yes, Jesus. So, Lord, this morning we say, come, come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, into this place. Come, Holy Spirit, into the homes of those that are watching. And, Lord, we say, awaken your church, not just crossroads. Lord, start with us, but not just crossroads, but awaken your church. Awaken all of the churches here in central Vermont. Lord, we lift them up to you and say, we want them to succeed. We want them to, to grow and prosper. We want your Holy Spirit to be evident in, in other churches in the area. Lord, we lift up faith community. We lift up Barry E. Free. We lift up uh, Living Hope. We lift up um, Lighthouse. We lift up um, the Church of God there up on the hill. Lord, we, we lift them all up to you and we say, awaken, awaken, awaken your church. Move, Lord, move. Lord, this morning as we read through in Daniel, another <laughs> miracle story, a miracle thing that happened, not just a story, but fact. Lord, awaken in our spirit a boldness, a boldness to walk in faith, just like the people of the past have done. And Lord, as we walk in faith, we pray, Lord, that you would show your wonders, your signs to us. And that those wonders and signs would empower us even more to walk out this walk in faith. In faith, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this time to worship you. Thank you for, for this time to sing our prayers to you. Come, come, God. Come, Holy Spirit. Awaken us. Help us, Lord, as we dig into your word. Help us to um, not just read the words, but we pray, Holy Spirit, that you, you would quicken in our spirits something. That as we read these words, they would jump off the page and not just into our minds, but into our hearts. And that they would cause us to see this life we live differently. Thank you, Lord, for this time to do so in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What a great way to start a Sunday, huh? <laughs> so our kids are being dismissed, a little shuffling going around. Um, just as a reminder for, uh, you know, we have these green... Um, green marks on the chairs, if you could find the green marks so we can properly space out. And... <sighs> that was good. <laughs> so thank you, worship team. Um, we are so blessed to have so many uh, worship leaders and worship teams, and I'm so grateful that, um, uh, that they spend time in prayer and uh, sometimes in fasting. Fasting goes along with prayer. And... Um, asking the Holy Spirit and, and God to reveal the songs to sing and, and how we're to go about organizing the service. It's so, we're, we're so blessed, so, so blessed. Uh, so thank you, worship team um, and musicians and uh, Jenny and, and Roger for back there, kind of keeping the wheels on the technical bus back there. 
Um, <laughs> sometimes they fall off. Um, <laughs> but that's okay. We put them back on, right? Um, so before we get started in the message, I wanted, I wasn't sure I was going to do this, um, but I'm going to because um, I'm feeling prompted to. So I had a, a dream Friday night, um, and it may have been early Saturday morning, and it's not very often that I have a dream and then can wake up and remember the dream, um, and this one was very, very vivid. And as we read in Daniel, and Daniel prayed, God, reveal to us, Lord, have mercy on us that we might re know this dream. Reveal that to us so that we can know. And uh, I have a feeling this was something God put inside of me through a dream that he wants me to share with you. Uh, because uh, sometimes we can have dreams and they're just for us. And I think part of the dream was just for me. But this, there's one... Uh, anyway, here's the dream. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the dream was that I was in the military, and it wasn't a, uh, a government military, okay? We, we didn't have patches or flags on, on our outfits. We were in camos. They didn't look like any camos I'd ever seen, but we were in camo, camouflage gear, and uh, we had backpacks and all that stuff, and... The, the first part of it um, was that we were in a Humvee driving along, and there were lots of us in this vehicle. I don't know how we all fit in it, but it, it like felt like it would be a Humvee kind of vehicle, the way it was moving around. And all throughout this ride, I had no idea where we were going. You ever feel like that? You don't know where you're going? Well, we had no, I had no idea where I was going, but I was with these people, and I could not tell you their faces. I don't know any names of anybody that was in the vehicle with me, but the sense that I got was that these people were on my team, and whatever it took, we were supporting each other, and I don't know if you've seen like pictures of the military where there's one guy laying, and then there's another guy laying, and he's got his head on the other guy's stomach, and then they're like just sprawl all over the place leaning on each other, and that's how it was in this Humvee where if someone needed some support to sleep, the other one would kind of move so that person could sleep. Um, if somebody needed encouragement, encouragement was given. If somebody needed uh, whatever was needed, it was just kind of all done. And so the message in that part, God revealed to me, was that we are all soldiers. Okay, let me say that again. We are all soldiers for Christ. And while our military outfits don't look like military outfits, we're all on this, this ride going somewhere. In, in some cases, we don't even know where we're going. And, and God's put us together to be able to lean on each other and encourage one another. And there's nothing like that feeling of, being, of going somewhere you don't know where you're going, and, and yet you're in the midst of people who just no matter what support you and will, will go out of their way and be uncomfortable so that you feel supported. You, you ever ha have somebody lay on you and you're like completely like not comfortable, but you're like, I I'm willing to be uncomfortable so that this person can get the rest that they need. That that's kind of how it felt. Of these guys, these people, I say guys, but it could be, it could have been women. I could not see faces. Um, and, and so know that we are in this together. We are in this Humvee together <laughs> and we're riding along and who knows where we're going but we're in it to support one another. So don't forsake gathering together, even in smaller groups, calling out to people and saying, hey, will you help me with this? Uh, because we, we do that for one another. Uh, the second part of the dream um, was that training had completed and we're heading out to the battlefield. And uh, again, I couldn't see faces. I couldn't uh, recognize exactly where we were. Um, I just knew that in the midst of all the people that were there, there was this sense of the enemy is just over that, that wall. It's just over that wall. And there was, there was talk and rumors about who that enemy is and what that enemy would look like. And so me and a couple others got curious. And we decided to go approach this wall and peek over so that we could get a look at who the enemy was. And so... 
everything else disappeared except for the three of us as we were walking. And I could hear these voices behind me saying, don't do it. Don't do it. And yet we continued walking towards this wall to go take a peek at the enemy. It wasn't one inch above. We didn't even see the enemy. Our head peeked up above that wall one inch. And as soon as it did, our entire bodies got riddled with some weapon that just tore us apart. And I, and I remember laying there bleeding and there was something sticking out of my stomach and I'm pulling it out and there's just blood everywhere and then I pass out. And then the next thing is that I, I woke up in a hospital kind of atmosphere, in a rehab kind of atmosphere, and we were being rehabbed and put back together. And I remember laying in that hospital feeling like this was time wasted, that I was in the hospital getting patched up for something that I had been warned about not to do. And, and so I'm being patched up, and it's been months that I was off of the battlefield, off of the front lines of being able to do what it is that I was in the military to do. And then finally, I got to go back. And so God revealed to me several things about this particular part of the dream. The enemy is sin. The enemy is sin. And whenever we take the opportunity in our walk and we just... We just kind of peek over the hill at that sin. That sin will tear you apart. It will tear you apart. Don't, don't flirt with sin. That, that's what we were doing as we approached the front lines. As we peeked over the wall, we were flirting with sin. Didn't realize it at the time until God revealed that. And as soon as we started flirting with sin, what happened? We were completely destroyed. Not killed, but destroyed. And the next several months, maybe a year, who knows how long it was, we spent trying to rehab and fix the wrongs that were done from that sin. And as a result, we were removed from the purpose that God had called us for in our life. And so I, I, this dream, God saying to us, don't flirt with sin. It will destroy you. I don't know who that's for specifically. Partly for me. Don't flirt. with. If you're flirting with sin now, stick your head back behind the wall, turn around, go find a friend and say, help me not approach that wall ever again. It, it's that bad. It's, it's that dangerous. We are all soldiers. We're, we're all part of this army of God. And we all have our different parts to play. Some of us might, you know, the military doesn't just have everybody as a soldier with an M16, send them out. No, everybody's got their own role and function in the military. Some deal with logistics and making sure that everybody has what they need. Some cook. Some build buildings. Some are on the front lines with an M16. Some are on behind the lines with the mortars. Some are in the, in the trees as a sniper. Some, there's all kinds of different roles that we have to fulfill. And if you stick your head up above the wall and flirt with sin, you are going to get taken out of the battle. And what does that do to the body? So Im imagine, imagine this. Your, your entire mess crew, your entire group that cooks for you does this. And, and they're gone. They're taken out of the battle. And then all of you go back and look and like, man, we burn water. We have no idea how to cook because God hasn't gifted us that way. How are we going to eat? We can't eat without all parts of the body doing what it's supposed to do. And so I'm saying to you what... I don't know what it means for you specifically. Do not flirt with sin. Do not. It will destroy you. <laughs> There's another part of the dream, but I think that one was for me, so I'm going to save that one, all right? <laughs> but we are all part of this army. Don't flirt with sin. Support one another. Those, those two pieces, those two parts of the dream go together. You know, we're, we're here to support each other, keep ourselves, keep each other away from that, 
that wall of flirting with sin. All right, let's get back on track with Daniel. Not that that's off track, because I think God, God wanted that this morning. Um, all right, so we're in Daniel chapter 3. Um, two weeks ago, we started this series in Daniel. Uh, the first chapter is really an introduction to Daniel, uh, Daniel and his friends, um, who they were, how they came to be in this position. Uh, it's, if I could summarize up Daniel chapter 1, it's the sovereignty of God at work, putting people right where God wants them to be through, in this case, very difficult circumstances. Sometimes the circumstances are, are not bad, are not as difficult as this, but sometimes that's it. Uh, chapter 2, we heard about the dream uh, that God um, put on Nebuchadnezzar's mind and troubled him with and then revealed to Daniel and uh, as well as the interpretation. And so then that was told to the king and the king, the result of that was the king praised uh, the God of, of Daniel. Um, and, and once again, uh, continuing in this theme, God is sovereign in it all. Like how else does, if, if God is not all powerful, how does he put this dream on Nebuchadnezzar? How, if God is not sovereign, how does God reveal this dream to Daniel? Uh, so God can do whatever he wants to do in whatever situation, um, and, and he will do that, and he does do that. And today we're going to see uh, a little bit more uh, of God's, both of God's sovereignty and then also of the faithfulness of God's people in that walk. Uh, so let's start reading in Daniel chapter 3, starting in verse 1, and then I'll, I'll read and then pause and, and comment on and point some things out. Uh, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold. Now, we don't know what this image looked like. We don't know if it was a person or just a, an obelisk. We don't know what it was. It's just an image made out of gold. 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. In case you left your cubit ruler at home, uh, this means 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. So that's 8 stories of this gold image, whatever it is. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all of the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before it. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all other kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that the King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship will be immediately thrown into a blazing furnace. So the first question that came to my mind when I read this was, now, why in the heck is there a blazing furnace nearby? <laughs> um, and as I did some research on this, it was that furnace was necessary in order to create this big image. And the way this furnace was likely set up, it was likely carved into the side of a hill. And it was a very large furnace. It needs to be large in order to build something that's 90 feet tall and nine feet wide. Um, and so it was likely built into the side of a hill, so they, would, they dug it out, and then at the top part of the hill is where the, the chimney would come out, and it was kind of almost level with the ground of the top of the hill. And so they would, in some cases, throw the wood and other fuel into the top, and then there would be an opening in the side where they would stick the metal into the crucible if they wanted to melt some or Maybe they had a big, long piece of metal that they would put in a heat up and pull out and hammer. Uh, but that's kind of the thought that how this was created. And it was necessary to have it nearby so that this uh, image could be forged and created. Um, <clears throat> and, and another purpose for this being here was to incite fear into the people. This furnace was already going. It, it was already uh, hot. And, and things were, were burning inside of it. And most likely there was heat and smoke coming out of the top. And I can imagine as this announcement was made, 
uh, all of these guys like turned their eyes over to the furnace and was like, yeah, I don't want to go there. Like it was a method of fear and a method of punishment for them so that they uh, would obey what's being told of them. Verse 7, therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. <clears throat> At this time, some astrologers came forward to denounce and, and denounce the Jews. They said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. Your majesty has issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the hoot, of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold. And that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into the blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, your majesty. They neither, they neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Now, isn't that just like people? Now, first question I have is, if you're bowing down and worshiping this image, how in the heck are you seeing what the Jews are doing? Now, I have a feeling these guys wanted a reason for getting these three in trouble. I think they were looking for an area. The way this is written, in the way it specifically says the Jews twice in this passage, as they're talking to the king, they, they had this animosity towards them. And this animosity is not just for this time uh, that we're reading about. It's for all of time. There's an animosity towards God's people. There is, this is Satan 101. You know, you, you go to, you go to um, a little Satan minion class, and the first class they, they, they teach is hate the Jews, hate God's people, because they stand for what God stands for. And, and so the, these guys are no different. They don't serve God, so we're going to look for any reason we can to implicate these guys and get them into trouble. And here's our opportunity. Let's get these guys in trouble. So they're, they're looking for uh, a reason. They have this hate in their hearts. And so off they go to tell the king. I, I imagine they were even more upset because the king had promoted them, had promoted these, these Jews to these positions of, of leadership. Like, why are they here? They don't deserve to be here. Well, let's keep reading on what happens. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, because he couldn't believe that nobody, anybody would, would deny him, would, would disobey him. So he says, is this true? <laughs> Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of the gold I have set up? Surely not. Now, let's give you a second chance in this because I don't believe what these knuckleheads are telling me. Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music, if you are ready, which I think you will be, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? This king could not afford to be disobeyed. He couldn't. He had established this wide-reaching kingdom. And in order to keep this kingdom into, in control... Each person had to obey. And if somebody stepped out of line and disobeyed, off with their heads. Or in this case, into the fire they went. He couldn't afford to have somebody defy him like that. So he gave him another chance. But here's what our three friends say to him. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, 
We want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. So we're going to camp on these verses for just a little bit here because I think, I know, there are some very, very deep theological truths in here. And these truths that are in this, what these three guys said, reach all the way back into Genesis and they go all the way forward into Revelation. This is the same all throughout God's word, okay? So number one, number one, we do not answer to men. Ultimately, we answer to God. Now, notice when they said this, I'll put that verse back up there again, how they said this, okay? Because this is key. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this manner, matter. In this matter. Are there things that you might need to defend yourself about to other men? Are there there things that other men hold you accountable to? Yes. For instance, the speed limit. Yes, officer, I was going a little fast. Here's your date. Show up at court or pay the fine. So, so that's a matter where the, the, the law, the people, the, the law that people have set up, you have to defend yourself and you're accountable to that to men. Now, you can't say to the, the officer that pulls you over, officer, I do not need to defend myself to you in this matter. Like, are you kidding me? Please step out of the car. <laughs> you're going with me. There are other areas that we have to defend ourselves or are accountable to men. Uh, For instance, workplace policies like where to put your food. You put your food in the fridge because if you don't, then mice come and animals come. Don't microwave fish in the microwave oven. Please never do that. That's terrible. That's bad workplace etiquette. You You will have to defend yourself to men about that. That is not something that you answer to God about. You answer to your coworkers about. Um agreements or disagreements with your spouse you know how do we do things around the house what what things will you do what things will i do those are things that you answer to your spouse about do not come out of this message and say to your wife after this what honey i do not need to defend myself to you in this matter (laughs) don't do that okay please don't do that But in this case, in the object of worship, in the object of who God is and the place he holds, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are absolutely correct. They do not answer to men about this. They answer to God about it. And the same thing about you. If your government ever tells you that you can't worship, I'm telling you to defy that order. Worship God and God alone, because uh, Jesus says this uh, in Matthew 10, 28. Do not be afraid of those who, will kill the, who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be the, afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. This is one of those matters. Your, your area of worship, your object of worship, that's between you and God. Let no man come between that. And if they try to, quote Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, in this matter, you have no authority over me. I'm going to worship God. Number two, (laughs) God is able to do anything. This is the sovereignty of God on display. These guys says, my God, uh, verse 17, they, they quoted to, to the king, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, God we serve is able to deliver us from it. He's able to. Just like when Jesus was standing up on the mountain and Satan was saying, why don't you throw yourself down and command angels to come? Could, could Jesus have said, my God is able to do that? Yes, he could have. But he responded in saying, but the word says, don't tempt your God. Don't tempt him. So Jesus wasn't saying God isn't able to do that. God is. 
but he's following God's will and saying, God said not to tempt. And so in the same ways, these guys are saying, my God is able to do anything. I want to say that again so it sinks in. Our God is able to do anything. Matthew 19, 26, Jesus said, with man, this is impossible. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have said to King Nebuchadnezzar, with man, yeah, you're right. Who could save us from this? But with God, all things are possible. All things are possible. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. Number three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ended up saying that God will deliver us. God will deliver us. They were confident in what they said in this matter. But they didn't mean that God will deliver them and keep them safe in the fire. That's not what they meant here. Ultimately, the king thought he was putting eternal punishment, forever punishment on these guys by throwing them into the fire and killing them. His idea was, you're done. It's over with. I control the rest of your life, the rest of your existence. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are saying, no, 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 no. Our God is able to deliver us from this fire and and keep us safe and keep us our bodies intact. And he will deliver us from you. Not, maybe not in this life, but in eternity. He will deliver us from what you think is eternal punishment, but it's not because our God will deliver it. Today, we have confidence because of Jesus. Jesus will deliver us. When our last breath is breathed and we close our eyes for the last time, Jesus will deliver us from what should have been the pits of hell for us. And he will deliver us out of that to heaven. And these guys had the same confidence that God would deliver them in eternity. For eternity. So, God is able to do this. God can do anything. God will deliver us. Maybe not like how you think it might happen, but God will deliver us. And then they say, Right now, here and now, even if, this is number four, even if God doesn't, even if not, we will still worship God. We will still worship God. This decision, this decision right here, even if things go bad, I'll still worship God. That decision needs to be made when the going is good. You need to make this decision now. If if at some point the going gets bad, am I still going to worship God? If everything I have is taken away and I'm struggling, will I still worship God? If if somebody, I pray none of this, this doesn't happen to anyone here. But it happens today. If somebody holds a gun to your head and says, denounce God or die. Even if, even if the worst thing happens, we will still worship God. These guys decided this when the going was good. So when the going got tough, they had already made up their minds. Let me give you an analogy. Let's say you need to lose some weight. Okay? Okay. And you make the decision, I'm only going to eat these kinds of foods. And you need to make that decision when the going is good. When you're sitting down and you're saying, okay, this is the decision I'm making. I'm going to decide this is what I'm going to eat. Now, if you wait until you're hungry to decide what it is you're going to eat, that's not going to go well. Because you're going to eat whatever's in front of you. And let me just say, what's going to be in front of you is not going to be the best choice. You cannot wait until you're hungry to make the decision on what you're going to eat. Because if you wait until you're hungry, it's too late. If you wait until you're, you're faced with trouble to decide whether you're going to worship God, it's too late. 
You're going to make the easy decision. Eh, what's the big deal? I'll just take the easy road. But if you make the decision beforehand, when the going is good, when the going gets tough, it's easier to say, even if, even if God doesn't show up like I really, 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 really want him to, I will still worship God. God's able to do it all. God's able to do it all. And he will. Ultimately, in the grand scheme of things, in eternity, he will. But even if he doesn't in this moment, we need to worship God. We need to decide. Let's keep reading verse 19. <clears throat> and of course, this is what happens when someone gets denied something they want. Ever see a three-year-old in, in, in the candy aisle of the store being told they can't have something? This is King Nebuchadnezzar. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. Now, if you remember, uh, just two chapters ago, Nebuchadnezzar elevated these guys. He promoted these guys. He saw them. There's something about these guys that are amazing. And now his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual, which basically just means as hot as it can get. <clears throat> and he commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. Now, I'm not, I, I was curious at first why we needed to know that they were wearing all these clothes. And then I realized it's, it's for us to realize that, um, have you ever thrown flammable things into the fire? <sighs> I mean, it just catches on fire and goes crazy. These clothes were not designed like our clothes today. These were highly flammable objects. And, and God wants us to know that they were wearing essentially gasoline on them as they were thrown into the fire. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So the way I picture this kind of happening is they've got these three guys bound and they walk them up the hill of the furnace to the, the chimney part, which would have been huge in order to accommodate all the metal that they were doing. And the flames are like shooting out of this furnace, out of the top of it because it's so hot. Uh, it's like when you, when you go to that bonfire and somebody throws on an extra 15 pallets and it, that's what it was kind of like. And, and so they got these guys and they throw them over the edge of the furnace. And as they throw them to the edge of the furnace, they're wearing the gasoline clothes. And so then they catch on fire and burn. And yet Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego end up in the furnace. So... Uh, so it killed the shoulders, and these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. So they're in there. The three guys, the guys that had them bound up are dead. Uh, the king's looking. And I love this next part. I don't know about you, but whenever I watch a movie where the, good, the bad guys get thwarted in their, like, their like, evil scheme or whatever, and the good guys, through some crazy turn of events, get, and my wife can tell you this, they get, like, thwarted in it and I like start cheering out loud cheering and laughing like yeah so there you got it <laughs> so if I was watching a movie and this was a movie this is kind of what I would do at this particular scene uh, as the, the guys fell in and then I can just imagine the the, the it's zooming in on Nebuchadnezzar's face as he kind of gets all like what's going on and then zooms over to the furnace just just imagine that in a movie form as we read sorry the king Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like the son of the gods. <laughs> this is, yay! Good guys win. 
Here's a prophecy from Isaiah about this, okay? Isaiah 42, 43, 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. So God's talking to God's people. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. Watch what it says next. When you walk through the fire, whoo, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Mm-mm-mm. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are quoting Isaiah at this point, saying, our God is doing this right now. We are in this fire. I, I wish, I don't know if there was a dialogue. I mean, I so wish we could have been like a, a fly on the wall to hear what they were, what was going on. I, there, it's missing from here what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, were feeling in this moment, were experiencing as they're standing in the midst of the flames, and here's this fourth figure that comes that's the Son of God. Um, I'll give you a, a theological term for this. This is called a Christology. And, and so anytime you see Christ appear in the Old Testament in this kind of form, it's known as a Christology, where Jesus, the Son of God, appears. Um, and there, there are many instances of this happening throughout the Old Testament. Um, this would be a great exercise to do sometime is as you read through the books of the Bible, try to find Jesus in them. Try to find where the Bible references Jesus in that. Now, it's going to be much easier as you get into the New Testament because Jesus is all over the place. But in the Old Testament, he's there. This is one of those instances where Jesus was in the furnace with these three guys, helping them to not get burned and set a fire. Let's keep reading. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God. Ha <laughs> ha, recognition. He finally recognizes. Come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Can you just imagine the scene? Like, this would make it an excellent movie. I can just imagine this scene where they're like, they're like sniffing them, and they're like, grabbing them and turning them around and inspecting their clothes and looking at them with their eyes and like, man, every hair is intact. Every article of clothing is good. But what happened to the bindings that had them tied up? Those are gone. Look at their hands. Their, their hands are all intact. It burned up the, the, the rope, but not how in the... What? Then King Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel. Now, Nebuchadnezzar didn't understand what was happening. So he, he thinks it's an angel, but it was the Son of God that came. God sent Jesus to be there for them, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They, being Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than to serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other god can save in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. The sovereignty of God at work again. God could have done, God could have accomplished this any number of ways. So Jerusalem gets destroyed and delivered into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar hauls these people off, and now they're living in exile. And God could have chosen to do, make it make possible any way he wanted to for those people to be protected. Like he could have just put a, 
an angel bubble around them. I don't know. He could have done, God can do anything he wants. And yet he chose very publicly to show off what he could do to the people of Babylon. Look, you throw these guys into the furnace, I'm going to keep them out. I'm going to keep them safe. And Nebuchadnezzar recognized this. And Nebuchadnezzar made the decree. Don't touch God's people. <laughs> A pagan king just said, don't touch God's people. If you do, we're going to cut you to pieces and your house is rubble. Like, that is... Think about that for a second. I won't say that. I was going to make a reference to our government, but it just, uh, it would not have turned out well. God used this circumstance to protect his people. No matter what it is, they were at the point of facing death by burning. They stood their ground and said, I don't care what you do to me. God is able to. He will ultimately. But if he doesn't here and now with this body, we will continue to worship. And as a result of that stand, God intervened. And now they have this ultimate protection. Nobody in the entire kingdom can treat these guys badly ever again. What a great turn of events. What a great turn of events. So there's a passage in Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. And actually, if you would turn there, if you have your Bibles, Hebrews chapter 11. This chapter is known as the Hall of Faith. Um, I don't know, it, it doesn't actually say that on there. It's just kind of what some people refer to this passage as Hall of Faith. And it basically outlines so many different Old Testament uh, events that took place. And people that were in those events and why those events turned out good is because they all had faith. They all had faith in God. And so I'm going to give you a quick definition of faith. Uh, and actually, I'm not going to give it to you. God's word's going to give it to you. So let's read uh, Hebrews 11, verse 1 and 2. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And by ancients, it just means those that went before us, those in the past. So faith is confidence, confidence in what you hope for. Did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have confidence in what they hoped for? Yes. They had confidence in being delivered from this king. They had confidence in God's ability to do anything. That's what they hoped for. And they had assurance in the things that they could not see. No other place has it been documented where three guys or even one guy went into a blazing furnace and came out. It had never been seen before. And I'm not sure it's ever been seen again. So coming, surviving, being thrown into a furnace is definitely something not seen. And yet they had an assurance in that. That's what faith is. Faith is being assured of what you can't see. So I want you to jump down to verse 32 and watch this little reference here. See if you catch it. The writer of Hebrews says, and what more shall I say? Uh, if, you, if you look above that and all the paragraphs, if you got your Bibles open, which is a great reason to have your Bibles, by the way. Uh, we put up the verses here, but you can kind of see what's going on before and after. All of those paragraphs, most of them start with by faith. And all the paragraphs after this, by faith. Writer of Hebrews says here, and what more shall I say? I don't, do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah. About David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what is promised. Who shut the mouths of lions? We're going to get there soon quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword whose weakness was turned to strength who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies these little guys Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
This is their little call out in the New Testament to their faith. To, it wasn't because they were wearing a flame retardant suit. It was their faith in God that allowed them to quench the, quench the fury of the flames. Their faith was demonstrated before that in that they refused to worship anything but God. We've got to make that choice for ourselves. Are, are we the kind of people who, who will one day end up in, this, in a similar hall of faith? By faith, so-and-so spoke up and said, do you know who Jesus is? And by faith, because they were scared out of their wits about talking to Jesus, talking about Jesus to someone they had no clue about. But by faith, they opened their mouth. And by faith, the Holy Spirit intervened. And by faith, in the Holy Spirit intervening, this person came to know Jesus. You, you do that, you speak out by faith, you are in that person's hall of faith. Because when they get to heaven someday, they're going to seek you out and say, thank you so much for stepping out in faith to share Jesus with me. By faith, by faith, by faith. We need to worship him, whether it's convenient or not. Whether we think we have the words or we don't. By faith. Let me just summarize again that uh, grouping of verses that we had in the middle. It's so profound, the theological truth in this. In Daniel 3.16, we heard that we do not ultimately answer to men, but we answer to God. King Nebuchadnezzar, I don't have to defend myself to you in this matter. But you know what, King? My God is able to do anything. He can do anything. He's all-powerful. He's sovereign. He can do what he wants. He can do things that have never been seen before. In fact, he has done things. Nobody's ever seen the sea parted. Nobody's ever seen three guys come out of a fire. Nobody's ever seen somebody be pulled out of a grave and walking again after so many days in it and they smell funny. God can do anything. Number three, God will deliver us from the king's hand. He'll deliver you from whatever situation you find yourselves in. He will deliver you. It may not be in this life. I, I wish I could say that every single one of you will get delivered just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It will not always happen. You look at Stephen, the first martyr. He was accused for his faith, and he said, well, I'm not denouncing anything. I believe who Jesus is. And he was stoned. In that moment, as he's dying, as he's being stoned, there was a peace that fell over him. He was being delivered from that situation by faith. And number four, even if he doesn't, we will still worship God. Will you join me in saying, no matter what happens, even if not, even if it gets worse than it is now, even if this pain doesn't go away, even if I don't feel better, even if I, I for just can't can't get past it, even if I just can't, whatever the situation is, I can't get beyond it, I'm still going to worship God. I'm still going to worship God. Are you going to still worship God? You've got to make that choice now. I hear a lot of amens, and I hope it's all of you. I hope it's all of you would say amen to that, no matter what. Even if he doesn't deliver me in this situation, I will still, still, still worship God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us this morning out of Daniel. Thank you for the example of these four guys, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and um, soon to be Daniel, or continuing to be Daniel in this as well. Lord, thank you 
that you have given us uh, hope. <laughs> You've given me hope that you can do anything. So Lord, as I look through, look ahead at, at situations that might arise and things that might be coming, Lord, help me to have confidence in the hope I have in you. Help me to have the assurance even though I can't really see you with my own eyes. Help me have assurance even when I can't see a solution. Lord, build my faith. Build the faith of this church as a body. Build the, the faith of each individual here. And Lord, help us. Help us to never sway from the decision to worship you. No matter the circ circumstance, the situation, help us to always choose to worship you. Lord, we thank you that you've given us breath today. We thank you for allowing us to um, have this place to come and worship you. We thank you for allowing us to live in a country that allows us, uh, for the most part, to come and worship we pray for those, Lord, who um, are being persecuted in a way, being told they can't come and worship. We pray for those in other countries who are, are being persecuted to the point of death for coming and worshiping you. We pray, Lord, for the, the, the confidence in you, in, in them, that they would stay firm in their belief in you. And as we follow their example, help us, Lord, to stay firm in our belief that you are the one and true God, and we will not worship anything else. Thank you, thank you, Lord, for this time as we head out from this place to our, our work. Uh, and Lord, we thank you for jobs, for places to go work. As we head to our workplaces, as we head to the, the stores as we head to interact with, with others, Lord, help us to by faith speak the truth of who Jesus is, that others might also experience faith in you. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Bless us as we go in Jesus' name. Amen. A quick reminder, please pick what you can from the garden. It's getting towards the end of that. The corn, if you find some, is, I think it might be the best. It might be the best in central Vermont. So help yourselves to the garden. God bless you. Be safe. And we'll see you next week.